The last thing, quickly, for five minutes, I'm just going to show you some photos of what it's, what it's like to work in a developing country, whether you've been before travelling or volunteering. The reality is slightly different from all the nice pictures you see on the website of Rally International or BSO. This photo, I guess, is what's more commonly seen. You see volunteers in the community in the winter, by and everyone looks happy. That's about five minutes of your time out of about six months of a project. So it's, it's what everyone wants to work towards, and it's the, one of the end goals, but it's not the reality. Um, I lived in a city called Trujillo, which is on the north coast of Peru. Um, it's the city in the desert, and this is the, the central plaza. It's, it's pretty nice, it's clean, nice buildings. It's the second biggest city in Peru. It's, it's not, well, it's fairly well off, but you still have poverty on the outskirts and wealthy people in nice neighborhoods. Beach was close by, and so in terms of living there, there was a few malls and a couple of nice restaurants and go to the beach. It was pretty good. It wasn't like living in a developed country, but it wasn't like living in poverty. This is just a typical street. Most buildings are unfinished for different reasons. Um, they're 90% of cars in here are taxis, so getting a taxi, you'd never pay more than a dollar for a taxi that's half an hour. Um, it was just, yeah, until you've been there, it's hard to describe. There's lots of cultural differences, but it's not like living in a slum. It was developed in its own right. Obviously, not quite as developed as here, but it's not abject poverty. This, however, is an example of one of the slums on the edge of the city. All around the city, there's hundreds of these slums where people come from, generally come from the mountains. They come down in search of a better life because there's no work in the mountains. They come to the city. They can't afford a house, so they live in these places like this with um, wooden walls or mud brick walls, no roofs. It never rains there, so you don't really need a roof. That's not a problem. But here they have no electricity. Um, they don't have running water, anything like that. You might have a family of six or seven living in a one bedroom house. When you can afford it, you buy a door for your house, then you buy a window, um, you might buy a roof or a bed. We never worked with communities like this for the main reason being that they don't know the land, they invaded the land. So communities en masse will arrange a day when they go and invade a vacant piece of land and just overnight they'll build a town or a little suburb. Um, and I never thought it would be very good to help a community like that with electricity because you're sort of you're in a way saying it's okay to own that land, when in reality they don't, and when the owner maybe finally gets it sorted out, that turbine could be smashed down, or it could cause problems. It's not a long-term project. There's other ways to help these communities. Um, it's a shame not being able to help them being so close to home, but when you're thinking of a project that's supposed to last 15 years, you need to think a little bit beyond a year or two. We, however, lived in a really nice house. This is our gate. And uh, this was our house. It's an eight bedroom house in the nicest neighborhood, which is pretty much like living in somewhere like Miami. Um, in terms of volunteers, it's not very reflective of what it's like living in Peru. However, it's not the safest of countries. It's not completely dangerous, but it's not, it's not a place where you'd walk around with your iPod or your laptop showing because you'd get mugged. Um, so we had a security guard on our gate that was there all day, an armed security guard. And when he went to certain neighborhoods, but it was nice to have a house in a safe neighbourhood where you could walk around at night and there was no risk of being broken into. You could just relax and let your guard down. Whereas during the day you have to be a bit more um, prepared with where you are. So even though it cost a bit more money, that house was $800 a month for an eight-bedroom house, which is actually pretty cheap. Um, it was worth the extra cost for having some sort of normality while working there. Visiting communities was always my favourite time. That door was about this high because people in Peru are really short. Um, but basically people build mud brick walls and roofs and that's about it. That was basically the extent of the house for seven people. They all sleep in two beds, the mother and father and the kids. And it just involved walking around communities, visiting them, seeing what it's like. There's one of the volunteers sleeping on the floor. So when we went to do the installations, we just put sleeping bags and, and blankets on the floor and just sleep rough like that for a week. No running water, no baths, no showers, um, no hot water. Just living exactly like community does. And it's a great way of appreciating what it's like with no electricity 
and for the experience of a volunteer to see how much of an impact the electricity is going to have. If you're visiting communities searching for them, it's not that fun doing that week in, week out. I've probably spent about five months in the last two years living like that and getting back to England a couple of weeks ago was one of the best times of my life. This, although it looked comfy, was probably the best condition we ever had. Just put lots of rugs on the floor and um, rugs on the chairs, made a little den. That's why we slept for about seven days. And it's still freezing at night. Um, but that's just part of where you work. The food is just like the community have all the time, which is pretty much rice and potatoes and soup every single day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, after about two days, it's hard to eat, but you have to eat it. Um, there were no, nothing special done for the volunteers or for us when you visit the community. They just treat you like you're one of them and you live like they would. And then during, probably during the installations, one of the best times was installing the electronics. Um, the picture on the right is a volunteer who spent about two days trying to fix um, the lights because they didn't work. We spent two days trying to fix it, ready to get it done for the unveiling. And we switched on the switch and nothing worked. And we found out that one of the volunteers who was an electrician had made a huge mistake and got it all wrong. So we spent days fixing it just in time. And then on the left, the only way we could reach the top of the roof was for someone to stand on my shoulders. And the reason the guy is pushing me is because I'm about to fall backwards. But installing the electronics was part of the project. Um, even though none of us were expert electricians, what we did was still safer than what is normally done in Peru. Nothing's earthed, nothing's protected. Um, and also in these communities, no one has the skill of doing electrics. So we also did, did that as well, as part of the project, part of the lights and cables to have a basic installation. Um, obviously working in the Andes, the, the views are pretty amazing, although you do get bored of them after a while. Um, and then this particular time, the communities are very proud of what they what they built. Um, they build all of their houses, they build the schools they live in, the community centres, health posts, everything is built by them, um, by hand, mud bricks or whatever. This particular time, they wanted to show us the toilets, they're quite proud of their toilets. And the one on the end that's open, they wouldn't let me take a photo of. I always take a photo of the toilet so volunteers know where they're going to go to the toilet next week. Um, it's an important consideration. They wouldn't let us take a photo of the end one. They said the middle toilet was the best one. It was the nicest looking. So we waited 10 minutes for someone to go get the key. They couldn't find a key, so they got a crowbar and smashed up the lock. And then all that fuss, and then we found the one toilet that had a tree growing out of it. Um, but take away the tree, it's just a hole in the ground. You're lucky if you get walls. Um, but yeah, they're very proud of what they build, and it's great to, to see what it's like to live there. Getting around, it's a huge country, Peru. It's, it would take you about 45 hours to drive from the north to the south of the country, and when you get into the mountains, it can take hours to drive, just a few, just 30, 40 kilometers because the road is so bad. This particular time, they were still building the road in front of us, so we had to wait a few hours for them to, to finish. Whenever we were lucky, we'd get a four by four to drive around. <coughs> this time we had to drive through a river to get to a community. And five months a year, that river is too high to drive through, so the community has no access whatsoever. They string cables across the river and just relay boxes and bags of stuff. Um, and this time there's a landslide in front of us. A lot of illegal mining goes on in Peru. And just about 20 minutes before we got there, someone was mining for coal and they caused a whole landslide and closed the road up. This car drove us up and down a huge mountain, which was impossible. And this trip, when we visited a few communities, we had to walk for nine hours on the top of mountains at 4,000 meters altitude um, because there's no road access to these communities. So it's quite demanding to visit them, but there's a reason they have no electricity, and that's because they're hard to get to, and it's hard to get services out to. So you have to consider how you're going to get there and everything like that when, when working with them. The wind turbines were normally shipped up in 4x4s on the back of pickups or this time on a minivan. Um, the car around Trujillo 
we had all this stuff driven around in a little taxi. Nothing ever fitted, so I always stuck out the back. And the one community we did this year in July, um, there was no road access, so we drove up to this point and had to carry everything for two and a half hours, two hours, to the community. This poor guy, I think he drew the short straw. His donkey's got two crates of um, metal foundations, and he's carrying that thing, which weighs about, probably weighs about 35, 40 kilos. He carried that non-stop for two and a half hours. Um, that high altitude, I don't know how he did it. The only thing I can imagine is that when he turned up, he was incredibly drunk and could hardly walk anymore, so probably drank his way all the way there. Um, a lot of things in, in Peru, and maybe other developing countries, you can, I suppose, say it's a lack of common sense, which I guess comes down to a lack of education. This is a lamppost in the middle of the road. Um, they were building a new road, and rather than move the lamppost or build the road in another place, they just built right through the lamppost and left it there in the middle of the road so no one could get past. That actually happened about three or four times last year in different places. So a lot of stupid things happen that shouldn't, and most of the time you just say it's, it's not very not much common sense. This is one of my favourite photos of how things aren't done properly in Peru. It's a photo of someone was welding onto this oil tanker and they hadn't grounded anything and weren't using welding masks, anything like that. Um, we took a photo and ran away just in case. I imagine most likely there was still fuel in that tanker and what's worse is they were welding on danger flammable signs. Um, and that kind of just sums up the stupidity and the lack of health and safety, which is probably the biggest um, concern when working in a foreign country or developing country. Because here, it may seem over the top sometimes, but we have a lot of safety procedures. We do <coughs> things in a certain way to avoid accidents. Um, and working in a, a development country where medical services, there's no ambulances. You can't call an ambulance or rush to help you. And hospitals are just awful. If something serious happened, you'd fly out of the country if possible to get medical attention. Um, so anything you can do safely, you have to do yourself. You can't expect people around you to do it safely. So contained within the volunteer group, we ran everything ourselves. What the local people working for Windows or everyone else did, you make yourself as safe as possible and carry on. Um, just a quick example, this is Fernando. He's calling up a tube of a wind turbine. Uh, it's a, not the one of them to be built. It's a larger one imported. <coughs> he and another wind aid engineer, two proven engineers, they had to fix a problem at the top of one of these turbines. It had an oil leak, that's about 25 metres up. Um, it was leaking oil, they had to get to the top to fix something, and you could only fix it while it was upright and someone was up there. And because that had an oil leak, you couldn't climb up the outside, and you couldn't climb up the inside of the tower where the ladder was. So their ingenious solution was to tie Jan to the top of the turbine when it's lowered down, raise it all the way up with him hanging on for his life, and then fix it and then lower it back down again. Um, not something you'd ever see down here, and he's, he's probably the luckiest guy to still be alive. But it just kind of shows their approach to health and safety. And the statistics show that there's something like 17 or 18 times more accidents in Peru in the workplace than in Britain, which is not surprising. And I guess when you're there working, you have to think about your own safety and do as much as possible. And then the last thing, just while we worked, we, when I started there, in 2009, we used to work in a garage, and then we moved to this workshop where loads of space. We had fairly good tools and a lot of space to work in when we built the wind turbine, boards, tool boards, tables, welding machines, and everything like that. Um, that's a mold for one of the blades that we would make. Materials and supplies. This is a shop called Sodimac. This is like B&Q. The problem was it's overpriced and never stuck to anything you actually need. So getting hold of materials in the country was very difficult. You couldn't get much of the equipment you wanted. You have kind of have to redesign your turbine or your project based on what you can get your hands on. Um, if you couldn't get what you wanted today, you had to go to local markets, which basically just walk down the street of endless stores that have metals and supplies on display and you have to haggle whatever you want. Um, 
being a foreigner, you always get quoted the stupid prices.